Hello and welcome back to Supposedly Fun. My name is Greg. I am here today because we are perilously close to the month of November, which of course means Nonfiction November, one of the biggest events here on BookTube. So I thought it would be fun to do a recommendations video where I talk about some great nonfiction books that I have read and some great nonfiction books, or hopefully great, that are on my TBR. If you would like to use these as inspiration for Nonfiction November, that is great, but you can use these any time of the year. I am pretty sure I did not read a single one of them in the month of November, so you can read them whenever you would like. But if that's for nonfiction in November, great. I am going to put links to all of these books in the description box down below so you can take a look at them on bookshop.org. That is a fantastic site that will support your in local independent bookstore or any other independent bookstore if you purchase from them. So if you'd like to find them online, you may do that. I highly recommend bookshop.org, which is where the links below will take you. You can also support your local library. That is a thing you can do, and I recommend that as well. So let's get into it because we have a lot of books to cover. I'm gonna start with the nonfiction books that I have read and I can vouch for and tell you that they are absolutely great. And the first one I wanna talk about is not gonna come as any surprise to anyone who follows this channel. It's Overground Railroad. The Green Book and the Roots of Black Travel in America by Ken Dacey Taylor. I listened to this on audio last year, and it was one of my favorite reads of the year. I had always wanted to see a physical copy of the book, though, and I finally got a chance when we were in Colorado doing our bookstore tour. I will put a link to that video in the description box down below as well. I found a copy of it in the tattered cover in Colfax, I believe, and it really surpassed my expectations. So if you want to seek out the audio of this book like I did originally, that's not a bad way to go you could do a lot worse. But if you can find a copy of the book and get it, please do so. A lot of work and care and thought went into the creation of this book. This book ostensibly looks at how, as cars became more readily available, road trips became a thing, Route 66 became a thing, and you got the idea of people traveling and having leisure time in this country. However, most of those things were not available to the black population in the United States because a lot of these towns were not open to black people, either because they had sundown laws or they just didn't want to serve black people. And there was so much segregation that traveling the country was very dangerous. So the Green Book was created as a sort of travel guide to tell people who were black and needed to be on the road for their jobs or for travel, for whatever reason, where they could go and eat, where they could go and get gas or spend the night and all kinds of things like that, things that you shouldn't really have to think about or worry about. And in doing that, it talks about the history of race in this country and ways in which conversations about race have been kind of hidden in it. Very directly ties all of this to the present moment. And there's a very kind of urgent personal reason why the story is good for Ken Daisy Taylor. And uh, I learned about it from the New York Times Notable list last year. There's a sticker on here that says it was a New York Times Notable book. That is where I first heard about this. And that is why I love that list. I definitely recommend this book. And again, it's just really beautifully put together. There are photos all the way throughout. You can see the covers of all the different green books and it's just really lovingly put together. So if you can swing a copy of the book, I recommend that a lot. It's a, a beautiful book and really fantastic. I feel like I learned so much from it. The next book I would recommend that I have read is The Five by Hallie Rubenhold. It is subtitled The Untold Lives of the Women Killed by Jack the Ripper. And I have a bit of a problem with true crime because it tends to sensationalize the crime or the killer or whoever's committing the crime. So now I feel like I need twists on that story. And this definitely is because everything we think we know about Jack the Ripper isn't necessarily true. I had always been taught that he murdered prostitutes. Well, the women who were murdered by him, a lot of them had done sex work in the past, but only one of them was actually actively working in that industry at the time of her murder. So the way in which they were framed by the newspaper at the time reflects the ways in which women were treated at the time, and especially lower class women. And this book really goes into that. It's not a happy book because these women didn't have happy lives and they did not have a lot of options or control over their lives. They struggled with substance abuse, like alcohol. They struggled with depression. One of them, her life was basically ruined by a divorce and they would end up in these lives that propelled them toward the streets where they encountered Jack the Ripper. And Hallie Rubenhold does everything she can to sort of take Jack the Ripper out of the equation and focus on them and give them their lives back. And it's a really great 
book. So I would recommend this one as well. The next book I want to recommend is something that I read this year. Actually, I listened to it on audio. It's Hidden Valley Road, Inside the Mind of an American Family by Robert Kolker. This was one of the New York Times top 10 books of 2020. I will put a link to that video where I react to their list in the description box down below as well. This is something of a difficult read, but it's really, really interesting, and it reveals a lot, and it is very well written. So I, if you can get past that, I would recommend it. Basically, it's about a family where they had, I, I want to say, 12 children, and 10 of them were boys. Eight of them ended up being diagnosed with schizophrenia, and it's about the changing understanding of schizophrenia and mental health in general over time. Like in the beginning, when the first son was diagnosed, there was such a stigma attached to it that and nobody really understood it. They blamed the mother. And the parents were so devastated by the diagnosis that they tried to hide it away. So when the second son was diagnosed, everybody, or there were a lot of people were surprised, but the parents already had information that things like this had been happening within the family. And in trying to hide it, they caused more pain and anguish along the way, including, including abuse of their daughters after they were born. And because of that, it is a painful read, but it is a really great book and I would recommend it again if you can get past that. It's sort of similar to the book Educated by Tara Westover, which is a kind of harrowing read, but a really great story and was one of my favorite reads of the year in which I read it. Basically, she grows up in a sort of fundamentalist family who is sort of living off the grid. Her parents are very paranoid about, like, her father doesn't want people to go to the hospital because he believes they will sort of like plant devices in the children and brainwash them and put chemicals in their body. He doesn't like them going to school because he thinks that the teachers are going to brainwash them. And that's sort of what he teaches them. So it's about her growing up and getting away from this family and the abuse that she suffers at the hands of this family, which is pretty horrible and becoming educated herself and pursuing education and she goes really far and it's a really great story it is very difficult for all of the reasons that i covered but it's a wonderful wonderful book and i would recommend it if you can stomach the abuse that she suffers the next nonfiction book i want to recommend is a graphic memoir i love graphic memoirs and this is one of my favorite books of all time I'll put a link to that video down below as well. It's Fun Home, a Family Tragic Comic by Alison Bechdel. This is the book that sort of launched her into the popular consciousness. It also was adapted into a Broadway musical, which I saw in Helena, Montana, and which was really fantastic. This is the story of her childhood and her relationship with her father. She did a sequel that was a relationship about her relationship with her mother, which I don't think was as successful for a bunch of reasons I really won't go into here. But her father died under semi-suspicious circumstances rather suddenly. He may have committed suicide. So she is looking at his life and his marriage and the things that he did. He had affairs with uh, other men, including men who were his students of his. Uh, his part-time job was that he ran a funeral home, which is where you get the title. And she looks at his life and how it shaped out and her life as a lesbian and how she became who she was over time. And it's a really fascinating look at family and identity and the changing ways in which LGBTQ people can live in this world and occupy space and be themselves. And it's about acceptance and it has a lot of philosophy in it. Alison Bechtel is kind of incapable of writing anything that doesn't talk about philosophy a lot. But in this book, it all serves the greater purpose of this story about her and her father and their relationship and I absolutely recommend it if you have not read it already. Sticking with the graphic memoir format, The Best We Could Do by T. Boy is another really fantastic book. So this is a little bit about generational trauma. And if you know me, you know I am fascinated by generational trauma. So she, her family immigrates from Vietnam and it's about the sort of lasting implications of the trauma that her family suffered in the build-up to and during the Vietnam War and then the difficulties that they had relocating to the United States and adapting to the culture here and the ways in which they sort of clung to the culture that they had grown up with and the children, like the author, adapted to America a little bit faster and didn't always understand the difficult things that their parents had been through. And it is written as she is becoming a mother herself, so and she is worried about passing on this trauma that her family has experienced to her children. 
it is a very resonant book. It is really beautifully done. The illustrations are all gorgeous and rendered in these shades of red and pink and black and white. I absolutely recommend it. It is one of my favorite graphic memoirs, and I like graphic memoirs a pretty good amount. The next book is another one that I read this year, which was recommended to me by Doris from Aldi Books because I needed to hit a, a, a checkbox on my reading challenge from the Montana Book Company to read a nature or science book. Doris recommended a bunch to me, and I chose the one that was most immediately available as an audiobook, and that was The Soul of an Octopus by Cy Montgomery. And I really loved it a lot. The physical copy of the book is really great if you can seek that out. And again, links to all of these books on bookshop.org are in the description box down below. What's really great about this book is that Cy Montgomery has a really palpable enthusiasm for the subject matter. She is basically working with an aquarium as they work with octopuses. And one of the things I learned from this book is that octopi is not really a word. It's octopuses. So that was alone something that I really got out of this book. But because she gets so emotionally involved, you really can't help but be swept away. And you learn so many interesting things. I didn't know octopuses were so interesting. And they really are. And they have these really vibrant personalities. Because unfortunately, since octopuses have a very short lifespan, she meets a couple of them in the course of working with this aquarium. And it feels devastating when some of the octopuses either start to fail uh, in terms of health or die. And that really speaks to the quality of the book, I think, and the way Cy Montgomery really pulls you in so you feel what she feels about the subject matter. And I just really enjoyed it a lot, to, uh, to the point where I recommended it to my husband, who also listened to it and also enjoyed it. So I'm just going to put it out here and say that if you are looking for something uh, a little bit quirky, a little bit short, a little bit different uh, and not super heavy, the Soul of an Octopus could be a very interesting pick for you. The next book is a little bit heavier. It's The Worst Hard Time, The Untold Story of Those Who Survived the Great American Dust Bowl by Timothy Egan. I listened to this on audio a couple of years ago, and it really stayed with me because I knew vaguely about the Dust Bowl, but I had never really learned about it in any sort of depth at all. Basically, when I learned about the Great Depression, the education I got stayed mostly in the on the coasts where the cities are, and they talked about the Dust Bowl a little bit, but only really in that they would mention that there was a lot of poverty and people would start fleeing to California in particular. And that's about all I knew. So when I really started to learn about it, it was almost horrifying because what people went through was really hard. And my husband has a lot of family that grew up in that area, some of them who grew up around that time. And thinking about what their childhood was like is really intense. So I learned a lot from this book that I had not been taught in school. And then my husband recently listened to this as well. And he grew up in Kansas and they didn't really teach him any of this. Or maybe if, if they did, uh, both of us just weren't paying attention. So I got sort of like a second education about a different way of thinking about the Great Depression and what happened. And uh, it, it talks about the way in which we use the land as well, which is another really interesting thing that I got from this book. Timothy Egan has a lot of other nonfiction books that I would also like to explore. But so far, this is the only one of his that I have read. And I definitely, definitely recommend it. I keep saying I recommend all of these books. That's why they're in the video. But I'm gonna, probably going to keep saying it many more times before we get to the end of this video. So please bear with me. The next one is something that sort of really introduced me to the culinary world. It's Kitchen Confidential by Anthony Bourdain. And one of the things about this is that I, I always was kind of fascinated by restaurants, but I never worked in one. Shortly after I started dating Joel, he was working in a restaurant when we met. And he to told me about this book. And I mentioned that I was not a huge fan of Anthony Bourdain, especially when he was younger and a little bit more brash. And Joel said the same thing. He's like, oh, no, no, I agree with you, but this book is really fascinating. So I read it, and it's a really interesting glimpse into the life of a kitchen and the life of a restaurant and what it's like and how crazy it can be. And reading it now, you can see ways in which it was difficult for people who were like women to get into restaurant kitchens and things like that and make it progress because they would just be put down and the type of personality that would get into kitchens and things like that. And it was really interesting. And I think that was the start of my shift into really understanding the food world, which is somewhere my husband comes from a lot and or understands a lot. And 
I now we're, we're at a point where pretty much my favorite TV shows are the only shows I really watch are baking competitions anymore. So it was sort of the beginning of this evolution for me in terms of understanding food and food preparation in the culinary world. And even though you, if you are not part of it, because I'm not part of it, it is a really interesting book. So I would recommend checking it out. The next book is actually two books. I have the separate editions, but they have been published together. It's Persepolis Volume 1 and 2 by Marjane Satrapi. And again, there is an edition that has them in one volume, and that is the one that you will find linked in the description box down below at bookshop.org. One of the things that struck me about this is that it's almost To Kill a Mockingbird-ish, in its, even though it's a graphic memoir. And again, I love a graphic memoir because it reflects the perspective of a child who is starting to witness really complicated political goings on and in this term religion, not so much race, but complicated and dangerous situations that are very adult and trying to navigate them. And in that regard, there's a comparison, it kind of ends there. But that's what it's about. It's about Marjane Satrapi's childhood in Iran as they headed into the revolution and how she grew up and eventually was sent to a boarding school, that's part two, and her relationship with that history and how she deals with it and grows up. It's a coming of age story. It is about a really heavy political time. And I was not very aware with the revolution in Iran at all. So it taught me a lot about something I didn't know about before. And I will always be grateful to it for that. It's also very funny in parts, which is another reason I think that To Kill a Mockingbird comparison sort of fits. The illustrations are really interesting and I absolutely recommend it. It's another one of my all time favorites. Speaking of which, if you follow along, you know I have a fascination with old Hollywood. I love the Academy Awards. So it probably comes as no surprise once I explain what this book is about that it is also one of my all-time favorites. It's Pictures at a Revolution, Five Movies, and The Birth of the New Hollywood by Mark Harris. Mark Harris used to write for Entertainment Weekly. That's kind of where I discovered him, and then I followed him on Twitter. He's a great Twitter follow, by the way. This book is actually taught in film schools because it talks about the move away from the studio system, which had basically had a stranglehold on Hollywood in its early decades, into the 70s, where cinema was a lot more revolutionary and groundbreaking, and then into the 80s, which you almost start to head into a sort of new studio system after that, but it's very different. So the method with which he explores the move away from the studio model is to look at the five movies that were nominated for Best Picture in 1968, which had been released in 1967. They are The Graduate, Bonnie and Clyde, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, Dr. Doolittle, and In the Heat of the Night, which ultimately won. Each movie was made and financed differently. Dr. Doolittle was the studio movie, it was a disaster, and each one pretty much embodies either where Hollywood had been, where it was trying to stay, and the push forward and influences of European cinema at the time. And it's just a fascinating book. If you are at all interested in Hollywood and movies like I am, this is a really interesting book. And I really want to read his other two books. One of is called Five Came Back, which is also a documentary on Netflix. And his most recent one is a biography of Mike Nichols. Mike Nichols obviously directed The Graduate. So his work on that book essentially started here, which is another reason I would find that interesting. The next one is a bit of a departure from that. It's All Boys Aren't Blue, a memoir manifesto by George M. Johnson. I listened to this on audio last year, and it was one of my favorite reads of the year. I, this is probably another favorite of all time because it's short, but it did a lot to expand my consciousness and teach me. And it also parallels my own childhood and coming of age growing up as a gay man in this country, but it really complicates that by also playing with the ideas of gender and race, which obviously I did not have to deal with as much. And so it finds ways of being relatable to somebody like me, but also it educated me a lot about other experiences of the world and other identities and the quest to understand yourself as well. It's the kind of book I really wish had existed when I was a teenager. And I'm so glad that it exists for teenagers today because these are topics that are very difficult. And George M. Johnson is extremely empathetic, extremely honest, even when it's kind of embarrassing to himself 
to be so forthright. And I really deeply appreciate that. I think he did a great job and I would recommend this book. I found it very enlightening. The next book is more likely to make you angry. It's Evicted, Poverty and Profit in the American City by Matthew Desmond. This was a Pulitzer Prize winner. And it is a really interesting study of people living in poverty, essentially, in inner city projects, low income housing, things like that, and the ways in which it is so difficult for them to get by and the ways in which landlords profit off of them all too often and can have them evicted and use evictions to make more money and the ways in which the police can get involved in all of these things. Matthew Desmond made a decision to take himself out of the narrative, which is a sort of interesting decision, and he outlines that in the after afterward of the book and talks about how in certain cases he'll mention that uh, a certain person had gotten a ride to their bail hearing or something like that. And in the afterward, he'll reveal that he was the person who gave him a ride. But he really tries to take himself out of the equation as much as possible because he wants you to focus on the stories. And I think that's a really noble effort. And I think it really pays off. It is a book that is likely to make you angry because a lot of the things that he has talked about have only gotten worse since then. And in this era of the pandemic, continue to get worse. So it might make your blood boil, but it will probably also teach you about things that you need to be aware of. And then on a somewhat less serious note, but not really, is Assassination Vacation by Sarah Vowell. This is something I read when I was still living in New York City. And one of the joys of reading this book at that time was that I lived near some of the landmarks that she mentions in a couple of the books. So I got to go look for the statue of John Wilkes Booth's brother and things like that. And that really heightened the experience of reading the book. It is about each of the presidents who have been assassinated, the life of the person who assassinated them, the why they were assassinated and things like that. And she sort of travels around. And it's a really interesting way of looking at American history. And she has a very quirky style, which anyone who has read a Sarah Vowell book will already understand. But I really deeply appreciated that. This was something that I read at a time when... I didn't really read a lot of nonfiction, and it is one of the books that helped break that barrier down because it was just so interesting. If you like narrative nonfiction, this is a great fit for that. I highly recommend it. It's a lot of fun. So with that, let's move into the books that are on my TBR, and we're going to start with two that are by Isabel Wilkerson. The first one is Cast, The Origins of Our Discontents, and the other one is The Warmth of Other Suns. I've heard amazing things about both books. I haven't gotten around to them because they're both really large books. And I have a hold on cast on audio. It's like a ridiculous amount of hours. But I am really looking forward to it because I've heard really good things. Uh, she won a Pulitzer Prize for at least one of these books. And I can't remember which at this moment. I apologize. But I really want to get to these. And the size is really what's kind of held me back. But I am going to try to push past that at some point. And if you're looking for a project book for Nonfiction November, the size of this would probably make it a natural fit. And these seem very urgent for our time because they deal with race in America. Cast reveals how we have had a sort of hidden caste system under the surface in this country all along. And it just hasn't really been publicly acknowledged. And that's really interesting. So I'm really looking forward to reading that, even though it will be a difficult topic. And then the next one is Crying in H Mart by Michelle Zahner. This is another one that I almost want to pause on because it very much deals with the idea of grief. Michelle Zahner is thinking about the death of her mother from pancreatic cancer. That is obviously a very difficult subject, but I've heard a lot of really great things about this book. And this is another one I have a hold on the audio on, but again, links to all of these books on bookshop.org will be in the description box down below if you would like to check them out there. Uh, you could also, again, go to your library. Crying in H Mart is recent. It was published this year, but you can certainly find it on platforms that are out there. The next one is The Day the World Came to Town, 9-11 in Gander, Newfoundland by Jim DeFade. This is something that was only recently recommended to both my husband and I. Joel actually listened to it on audio and loved it. He said it is going to be one of his favorite reads of the year. So I am going to try to get to it before the end of the year because it sounds like a really interesting story. Basically, it's about people who had been traveling when 9-11 happened and they got grounded in Gander, Newfoundland, and they were forced to stay there for a while. So it's about the ways in which the community came together to support these people. 
So it's, of course, sad and a little bit difficult because it deals with 9-11. But it's also uplifting because it's a story about people coming together in the face of hardship. And that sounds like it's a, a really beautiful thing. The next one goes back to my love of Hollywood. And I was gifted a copy of this by the wonderful people at Knopf. It's Competing with Idiots, Herman and Joe Mankiewicz, a dual portrait. So they were brothers who worked in early Hollywood. They were involved in the creation of some of the classic movies like Citizen Kane and All About Eve. Nick Davis is a descendant of these brothers. One of them was his grandfather. All About Eve is one of my all-time favorite movies. Citizen Kane is obviously a really great movie. So the story of these people, how they came to Hollywood and the ways in which they flourished and failed and things like that sounds really interesting. So I'm very happy to have a copy of this book and I'm looking forward to getting to it. And if you are at all interested in Hollywood the way that I am, I'd recommend checking this out as well. The next book stays sort of in the same theme. It's The Devil's Candy, The Anatomy of a Hollywood Fiasco by Julie Salomon. This was the focus of a podcast recently put out by Turner Classic Movies. I can't remember the name of the podcast, but they did an entire season based on this book and Julie Salomon's experience working with it because she was working as a journalist within the film industry at the time and she was given sort of unprecedented access into the making of the movie, The Bonfire of the Vanities, adapted from a wild best-selling book in the 1980s. And what nobody would have known at the time that she was given this level of access was that the movie was going to become a legendary fiasco in terms of like casting and the changes and the, it bombed and it just did not work. So she wrote a book using all of the material she had. She had to spend time with the cast of the movie, which was Bruce Willis, Melanie Griffith, and Tom Hanks. One of the incidents of this is that after Melanie Griffith had already filmed scenes for the movie, she came back having had breast augmentation and they had to figure out how they were going to shoot the rest of her scenes with this difference in appearance. And that just gives you a taste of what the making of this movie was. And it's wild. And I have listened to the podcast, all of the episodes of that season, but I really still want to read the book as well because it sounds absolutely fascinating and I can't wait to get to it at some point. The next book is also something that I learned about from the New York Times notable book list from last year. It's The Book of Eels by Patrick Svensson. I am going to refer to the description of this on bookshop.org, which I have not done for any of the others, because I think this sums up why this book is so interesting to me. Remarkably little is known about the European eel. So little, in fact, that scientists and philosophers have for centuries been obsessed with what has become known as the eel question. Where do eels come from? What are they? Are they fish or some other kind of creature altogether? Even today, in an age of advanced science, no one has ever seen eels mating or giving birth, and we still don't understand what drives them after living for decades in freshwater to swim great distances back to the ocean at the end of their lives. They remain a mystery. It also talks about the ways in which eels were a primary food source for humans over time, but now eel has become sort of, at least in the United States, has become something that most people would find kind of gross if they saw it on a menu in a restaurant. So it's about that changing perspective as well, but it's mostly about the scientific questions that remain about them. And I did not know that. So I can't wait to read this book as well. Then we get to After the Eclipse by Sarah Perry, and this kind of goes back to a little bit of The Five by Hallie Rubenhold, because if I'm going to read a true crime book, it has to have a different way of approaching the subject matter that does not sensationalize the crime or the person who perpetrates the crime. And Sarah Perry is coming from the perspective of the daughter of a woman who was murdered. It's about the murder of her mother two days after an eclipse, I believe. And it looks at the way in which the media approached the family and the ways in which the police approached the family. So it's a, it is sort of a true crime book a little bit, but it's about the perspective of the family of the victim. It really examines the ways in which they could be hurt by depictions of the victim and uh, the person who perpetrates the crime. And the lasting trauma of the murder itself as Sarah Perry grows up and becomes a woman and ultimately writes this book. And I've heard great things about it from two booktubers, both of whom I can't remember at the moment, but there were two of them who had talked about this book and uh, that just really grabbed my attention and it's been on my TBR ever since. And at some point, hopefully, I will get to it. We have two more books. Second to last is Logical Family, a memoir by Armistead Maupin. Armistead Maupin is the author of the Tales of the City books. That is his big claim to fame. This is about his own life a little bit and his own coming out and coming of age and his quest to find himself and find his own family. 
And it's about the changing tide of gay rights during his lifetime, which is... So it's interesting to me from a couple of different perspectives. It's a coming of age and coming out story, a memoir, done, cool. But it's also about the changing landscape of LGBTQ history during his lifetime. Yeah, that, I think that's fascinating because so much has changed in the course of his lifetime. And it's about that idea of like chosen family and what makes sense and what people traditionally look at as normal and ways in which that has gotten complicated over time, I would argue necessarily. So I really am looking forward to this book as well. And the final book was a Pulitzer Prize finalist in the nonfiction category this year. It's The Deviant's War, The Homosexual versus the United States of America by Eric Servini. And the premise of it is exactly what it sounds like. Basically, it follows the gay rights movement and it sort of complicates the story because most people think of the gay rights movement as starting with Stonewall. And this book starts at least a generation earlier talking about the early gay rights movements. And I know there have been a lot of books about that, but this is supposed to be a really thorough one. I believe it starts with Frank Kameny and the Mattachine Society and looks at all of the different movements that led to Stonewall and where we have gone since then. It's supposed to be very thorough and hopefully even-handed because a lot of gay history has sort of whitewashed the different groups and focused on the white male <laughs> groups and uh, characters that were involved in this. And I have heard that this one does not. Hopefully it won't do any of that whitewashing itself. But I've heard really great things about it and I am looking forward to reading it. So those are my recommendations for Nonfiction November and beyond. If you have any others that you would like to add, please put them in the comment section down below. Let me know if you have thoughts about any of the books that I talked about, uh, recommendations based on those or anything, anything you want to say. Tell me what you're going to be planning to read in Nonfiction November if you're going to participate as well. As always, I really appreciate your time and I will be back. Until next time, happy reading.